From the moment I met Ellie, I knew there was something special about her. We were both juniors at the University of California, Davis, lost in a sea of eager young minds. I was studying environmental science, and she was a vibrant art history major. Our paths crossed during a campus art exhibition. She was explaining Van Gogh's brush techniques to a small crowd, and her passion made her glow like the paintings on a wall. Isn't it amazing how a single brush stroke can evoke so much emotion? She said as our eyes met for the first time. I was pulled into her orbit, wanting nothing more than to hear all her thoughts. We spent that entire evening walking around the campus, talking about everything from our favorite books to our childhood dreams. Ellie had this wild enthusiasm for life that drew me in. Her laughter was infectious, her mind was a maze of fascinating ideas, and she looked at the world as if it was made of magic waiting to be discovered. It wasn't long before we started dating. Those days were filled with impromptu road trips, late night study sessions, and mornings where we'd linger over coffee, making plans to conquer the world together. It felt like we were building something unbreakable. By the time we graduated, I had no doubt in my mind, Ellie was the one I wanted to spend my life with. Three years after our graduation, on a sunny day in June, I asked Ellie to marry me in the Rose Garden where we had our first date. She said yes before I could even finish proposing, laughing and crying all at once. It was perfect. Our little fairy tale. But as with all tales, darkness found its way into ours, creeping in slowly, almost unnoticed. It began the night we decided to join our friends for a dinner and a dance, celebrating a decade of being inseparably in love. Little did I know, that night was about to test the very foundation of our marriage. After our magical engagement in the Rose Garden, Ellie and I didn't waste any time starting our life together. We moved into a charming little house in Sacramento, not too far from where we both landed our first serious jobs. I worked for an environmental consultancy, and Ellie joined a prestigious art museum as a curator. The excitement of shaping our future, piece by piece, filled our days with joy and our nights with dreams. We poured our hearts into turning that modest house into a home. Ellie's touch transformed each room into a gallery of warmth and style. Her knack for blending colors and textures turned our living space into something out of a design magazine. Meanwhile, I focused on the garden, planting everything from fragrant roses to hearty vegetables. Our home became our sanctuary, a testament to what we could build together. Children were always part of the plan. By our fifth anniversary, we welcomed our daughter, Mia, and two years later, our son, Lucas, joined the family. Parenthood was another layer of our life together, challenging yet deeply rewarding. Ellie was a natural mother, nurturing and creative, always finding new ways to teach and inspire our kids. I tried to instill a love for nature in them, just as my father had done for me. Despite the chaos of young children, Ellie and I made sure to keep our connection alive. We had regular date nights, sometimes just a simple movie at home after the kids went to bed, other times a night out at our favorite jazz club. It wasn't just about maintaining our romantic life. It was about staying best friends, staying interested in each other as we both evolved and grew. Our 10th anniversary approached, and we planned to celebrate it with a dinner and dancing night out with friends, a much-needed break from our routine. It was meant to be a night of celebration, a way to mark a decade of love and life together. Yet it also set the stage for the unforeseen challenges that lay just around the corner, challenges that would test the strength and resilience of our bond more than anything that had come before. It was a crisp February evening when Ellie and I joined our friends for our long-awaited celebration. We were a group of eight, all eager to step away from the daily grind and dive into a night of laughter and dance. The venue was a classy new club downtown, known for its lively music and elegant atmosphere. Ellie wore a stunning red dress that accentuated her vibrant eyes and infectious smile. She was breathtaking, turning heads as we walked into the club. Dinner was a delightful affair, filled with gourmet dishes and toasts to lifelong friendships and enduring love. As the plates cleared and the music picked up, our group moved to the dance floor, swept up in the rhythms of a live band. The atmosphere was electric, pulsing with the beats of jazz and the buzz of spirited conversations. That's when he appeared, Michael Reed, a renowned local soccer player known for his charisma both on and off the field. He was with a group that included his fiancée, 
but his presence was magnetic, drawing the attention of nearly everyone in the room, including Ellie. Our friends nudged each other with excited whispers as he laughed and danced, his energy seemingly boundless. As a slow song began to play, Michael approached our table. With a confident smile, he asked Ellie for a dance. It was a simple request, but one that felt like a crack in the ice beneath my feet. I watched, a lump forming in my throat, as Ellie hesitated for a moment before placing her hand in his. They moved to the dance floor, her laughter mingling with the music, her eyes alight with a thrill that wasn't for me. I tried to brush off the discomfort, telling myself it was just one dance, a harmless bit of fun. But as I watched them glide across the floor, Michael whispering in her ear, Ellie's face lit up in a way that I hadn't seen in a long time. The sight stung, a silent alarm ringing through the festivities. The dance ended, but the night had shifted. Ellie returned to our table with a flush on her cheeks, her eyes darting to where Michael was returning to his fiancé. The rest of the evening passed in a blur. I felt disconnected, my mind replaying that dance over and over. What should have been a night celebrating our love had some a seed of doubt that I couldn't shake off. We left the club in near silence, the air between us thick with unspoken thoughts. As we drove home, the distance in the car felt insurmountable. That night, as Ellie drifted to sleep beside me, I lay awake staring at the ceiling, grappling with a whirlwind of emotions. I was at a crossroads, caught between trust and betrayal, love and pain. Little did I know, the choices we were about to make in the wake of that night would change the course of our lives forever. The morning after our night out was unusually quiet. Ellie and I moved through our routines with a polite distance that hadn't been there before. The image of her in Michael's arms replayed in my mind, a loop of doubt and discomfort that I couldn't switch off. Breakfast was a silent affair. Even the kids seemed to pick up on the tension, whispering to each other as they ate. I tried to brush off the lingering feelings from the previous night, telling myself it was nothing more than a dance. But as the day progressed, the pit in my stomach grew. Ellie seemed distant, her usual lively chatter replaced by thoughtful silences and forced smiles. It wasn't like her, and it wasn't like us. By the evening, I couldn't take the silence anymore. Ellie, we need to talk, I said as we cleared the dinner table, the kids having retreated to their rooms. She nodded, her face unreadable. We sat at the kitchen table, the very heart of our home, now a stage for a conversation I'd never imagined we'd have. What happened last night? I asked, my voice steady despite the turmoil inside. Ellie sighed, her fingers tracing the wood grain of the table. I don't know, Alex. It was just a dance, but it felt exciting. I guess I got carried away. It's been so long since we've... Her voice trailed off, but the implication hung heavy between us. I felt a mix of relief and resentment. Relief that it was just a dance but resentment that she needed excitement from someone else. Is that all it was? Just a dance? I pressed, needing to hear it from her. Yes, just a dance. She replied quickly, too quickly. But it made me realize we might be in a rut, Alex. We're not really connecting, are we? Her words stung. We had been so focused on being parents, on our careers, that perhaps we had neglected us but the thought of Ellie seeking thrills in the arms of another man was too much to bear. I don't know how to respond to that, Ellie. I admitted, feeling a gulf widening between us. I thought we were happy. I thought you were happy. I am happy, Alex. With you, with our family. But last night reminded me of how exciting things used to be, she explained, her eyes pleading for understanding. It was a painful acknowledgement. Our life had become predictable, perhaps too comfortable. But the solution wasn't finding excitement in someone else's embrace. We agreed to work on our relationship, to find new ways to bring back the spark that had drawn us together in the first place. However, trust, once shaken, wasn't easily restored. As we moved forward, trying to bridge the gap that one dance had widened, I couldn't shake the image of Ellie and Michael. It was a crack in the foundation of our marriage, and as much as I wanted to repair it, Part of me wondered if some cracks were just the beginning of bigger breaks. In the weeks that followed, Ellie and I threw ourselves into mending our relationship. We planned date nights, took a weekend getaway, just the two of us. 
and even started a couple's therapy session. It seemed like we were making progress, rediscovering the laughter and closeness we once took for granted. Yet, the shadow of that night lingered, an invisible wedge that neither of us could completely ignore. One afternoon, I came home early from work, planning to surprise Ellie with tickets to a concert she had mentioned wanting to see. As I approached the house, I noticed a car I didn't recognize parked in the driveway. A flicker of unease sparked within me as I opened the door to sounds I hadn't expected. Laughter, not just Ellie's, but a man's. My heart thudded painfully in my chest as I walked towards the living room. There, I found Ellie and Michael, sitting close together on the couch, engrossed in an animated conversation. They looked up, surprise etching their faces, and Ellie jumped up. Alex, this is unexpected, she stammered, her cheeks flushed. Michael was just leaving, Michael said smoothly, standing and extending his hand towards me, which I ignored. The air was thick with tension as Michael said his goodbyes, Ellie avoiding my gaze. Once he left, the silence between us felt charged, heavy with questions I was almost afraid to ask. Why was he here, Ellie? My voice was calm, but it belied the storm of emotions raging inside me. He? He was just dropping off some tickets for the museum gala next week. She explained quickly, too quickly. Her voice was nervous, a stark contrast to the easy laughter I had heard moments before. Tickets. A seemingly innocent reason that didn't explain the intimate tableau I had walked into. The trust we had been carefully rebuilding cracked anew, deeper and more jagged than before. Tickets, I repeated flatly. And that required him to be here, sitting that close, looking that comfortable. Ellie bit her lip, a sign of her anxiety. I know how it looks, but nothing is going on, Alex. We were just talking. Talking, I echoed, the word tasting bitter. It seems there's a lot of that going on lately. Just dances, just talks. What's next, Ellie? She flinched at my tone, her eyes welling with tears. Alex, please. I swear, nothing inappropriate has happened. But the seed of doubt had rooted deeply, fed by her actions, and no amount of reassurance could now stanch its growth. I felt a cold distance settling in my heart, a protective barrier against further hurt. That night, as we lay in bed turned away from each other, the space between us felt insurmountable. Ellie reached out, her hand tentatively brushing mine, but I pulled away. I needed time, time to think, to understand if this was really the life I wanted, or if the love we had could withstand the storm. The consequences of that dance, of that afternoon, rippled out, touching everything. Our conversations became cautious, our touches rare. We were two people treading water, struggling to keep our heads above the waves of doubt and pain. The coming days would test us further, challenging the very foundation of our marriage. Would we stand strong, or would we crumble under the weight of suspicion and fear? The tension in our home grew palpable in the days that followed. Attempts at normalcy felt strained, each of us wrapped in our own cloaks of uncertainty and hurt. Ellie tried to engage me in conversation, her efforts at reconciliation palpable, but my heart had hardened, encased in a shell of suspicion. I found myself scrutinizing her every move, interpreting innocent gestures as potential clues to deceit. My thoughts became consumed with doubt, turning even mundane interactions into sources of angst. It was a torment I had never anticipated in our many years together. One evening, Ellie approached me while I was reading in our study. The look on her face was somber, her usual vibrancy dimmed by the ongoing strain. Alex, we need to talk, she said quietly, her voice trembling slightly. I set my book aside with a sigh, bracing myself for what might come next. What is it, Ellie? She took a deep breath, her hands nervously twisting the hem of her shirt. I can't keep living like this, walking on eggshells around you, feeling like a stranger in my own home. She started, her eyes welling up with tears. I know you're hurt, and I'm so sorry for my part in all of this. But I need to know if there's a way forward for us, or if. Her voice cracked, unable to finish the sentence. The air felt heavy, charged with the weight of her words. My mind raced, conflicting emotions battling within me. The part of me that still loved her wanted to reach out, to comfort her, to say that we would find a way to heal. But the wounded part, 
the part fueled by betrayal held back. Ellie, I just don't know. I admitted my voice hoarse with emotion. Every time I look at you, I'm reminded of that night, of seeing you with him. I can't unsee it, and I don't know if I can move past it. Her face crumpled at my words, and she nodded slowly, a resigned sadness settling over her. I understand, she whispered. Maybe, maybe some space would help. I could stay with my sister for a while, give us both some time to think. The suggestion of separation struck a chord within me, a mix of relief and profound sadness. It was a concrete step back from each other, a physical manifestation of the emotional distance that had grown between us. Maybe you're right, I replied, the words tasting like ash in my mouth. Some space might be what we need. Ellie stayed that night, but the next day she packed a bag, her movements slow and deliberate. Our children watched with confused eyes as their mother explained she needed to visit her sister for a little while. I saw the worry in their expressions, their young minds trying to piece together the changes unfolding before them. After Ellie left, the house felt emptier, the silence louder. I wandered through the rooms, each corner filled with memories of better times, each photograph a reminder of what we had risked losing. I sat down at the kitchen table, where we had shared countless meals and conversations, and allowed myself to truly contemplate the magnitude of our situation. Breaking down wasn't just about the collapse of trust or the distancing of hearts. It was about the disintegration of a life we had built together. As I sat alone, the future uncertain, I pondered the possibility of forgiveness, of redemption, and whether love could indeed overcome the deepest of hurts. The weeks following Ellie's departure were a blur of solitude and introspection. The house was quieter than ever, the spaces she filled with laughter now echoing with the silence of her absence. I grappled with a mix of emotions each day. Anger, betrayal, sadness, and, surprisingly, a hint of relief. It was this confusing amalgamation of feelings that made me doubt everything we had built. My days became routines of going to work, coming home to an empty house, and trying to maintain some normalcy for Mia and Lucas. The kids asked about Ellie often, their innocent questions stabbing at my resolve. When is mom coming back? was a frequent inquiry, one that I deflected with vague promises of soon. As the days turned into weeks, Ellie and I communicated sparingly, mostly about logistics concerning the children. Our conversations were polite, strained by the unspoken words hanging between us. It was clear that the space had given us both time to think, but whether it brought any clarity was a different matter. One evening, as I sat sorting through some bills, a message from Ellie popped up on my phone. Can we talk tonight? It was simple, but the weight of the conversation that would follow felt monumental. That night, we met at a neutral location, a quiet coffee shop that was a favorite of ours in simpler times. Seeing her across the table, the familiar yet distant features of her face brought a tightness to my chest. Alex, she began, her voice steady but her hands fidgeting with her coffee cup, I've been doing a lot of thinking about us, about everything that's happened. I'm so sorry for the pain I've caused. I never wanted any of this to happen. I nodded, my emotions a tangled knot. I know, Ellie, I believe you didn't intend for things to get this way, but they did. She swallowed hard, her eyes meeting mine. I know we've tried to figure things out to see if we could get past this, but I feel like this, this distance between us might be too much to overcome. The words hung in the air, heavy and final. It was the acknowledgement of what I had been feeling but hadn't yet voiced. The realization that perhaps our paths were diverging, that the trust we had built was perhaps irreparably broken. Are you saying you want a divorce? I asked, the words feeling foreign on my tongue. Ellie paused, her lips trembling slightly. I think it might be the best option for both of us, and for the kids. They need stability, Alex, and right now we can't give them that together. The formal decision to divorce came not with a bang, but with a resigned sigh. It was a decision made not out of anger, but out of a mutual recognition that some things, once broken, are too fractured to mend. We agreed to keep things as amicable as possible, for the sake of Mia and Lucas. The next months were filled with meetings with lawyers, discussions about custody and splitting assets. Through it all, 
Ellie and I managed to find a way to communicate better than we had in the last months of our marriage. Perhaps it was the removal of pressure to repair our relationship that allowed us to interact more freely, more kindly. Divorce, however painful, sometimes acts as a crucible, burning away the illusions and leaving behind the stark truths of a relationship. For Ellie and I, it was a painful yet necessary end to a chapter of our lives, allowing us to hopefully begin anew, separately but with respect for the love we once shared. The finality of the divorce brought with it a mixture of sorrow and liberation. Ellie and I had navigated through the turbulence of our broken relationship to a place where we could communicate without the weight of unresolved romantic emotions. Our focus shifted towards our children, Mia and Lucas, ensuring their adjustment to our new family dynamics was as smooth as possible. Co-parenting was not without its challenges. We had to learn to manage our time, emotions, and new boundaries, all while keeping Mia and Lucas at the forefront of every decision. Ellie and I established a routine of weekly family dinners, maintaining a semblance of unity for our kids. It was awkward at first, each of us tiptoeing around topics that might reopen old wounds. But as weeks turned into months, the tension eased, replaced by a camaraderie rooted in our shared commitment to our children's well-being. In addition to our joint efforts at parenting, Ellie and I found ourselves venturing into new personal territories. Ellie took up painting, something she had always been passionate about but never pursued seriously. Her weekends were often spent at art workshops or exploring galleries, which seemed to bring her a sense of peace and fulfillment that was palpable when she spoke about her day's activities during our family dinners. For my part, I threw myself into my environmental work with renewed vigor and also took up running. The physical exertion was therapeutic, a way to clear my mind and manage the stress that came with restructuring my life. It wasn't long before I was signing up for local 5K races, enjoying the sense of community and shared purpose I found among fellow runners. As Ellie and I grew more accustomed to our roles as co-parents, we also began to open ourselves up to the possibility of new relationships. It was a prospect fraught with hesitation. Neither of us wanted to introduce more change into our children's lives than necessary. However, we understood that part of building our new lives involved exploring personal happiness outside of our co-parenting roles. Ellie met someone through her art circles, a fellow painter who shared her passion for the arts and understood the complexities of entering a relationship with someone who had a significant past and responsibilities. They took things slowly, much to the relief of both Ellie and me, as we navigated what it meant to introduce a new significant other into the delicate balance of our family life. I too found myself interested in someone, a colleague from the environmental consultancy where I worked. She was understanding and patient, qualities that I came to value deeply as I explained the nuances of my situation with Ellie and the kids. Our relationship developed gradually, built on a foundation of respect and mutual interests in environmental advocacy. Co-parenting while exploring new relationships required Ellie and I to communicate more openly and honestly than perhaps we ever had during our marriage. We set clear boundaries and expectations, not only with each other but with our new partners. This open line of communication became the cornerstone of our ability to maintain a healthy environment for Mia and Lucas, ensuring they felt secure and loved, irrespective of the changes around them. Through it all, Mia and Lucas adapted with a resilience that both surprised and reassured Ellie and me. They enjoyed the expanded circle of adults in their lives, benefiting from the diverse influences and affections of our new partners, all while secure in the knowledge that their parents loved them unconditionally. This new chapter, marked by co-parenting and new beginnings, was not one I had envisioned years ago when Ellie and I vowed to spend our lives together. Yet, it held its own form of contentment and growth, a testament to the enduring strength of familial bonds, even when redefined under unforeseen circumstances. As the seasons changed and Mia and Lucas grew taller and more independent, I found myself reflecting more deeply on the journey Ellie and I had traveled. It was a time of introspection, where the quiet moments of the evening often led me to ponder the winding paths we'd taken, paths filled with both shared joy and personal heartaches. Sitting on the back porch watching the sunset, I think about the early days with Ellie, when everything seemed infused with possibility and hope. Those memories were tinted with a nostalgia that was both sweet and painful. 
I wondered sometimes if there were signs I had missed, moments when a different word or a different decision might have steered us clear of the turmoil that eventually appended our marriage. Regrets? Yes, there were a few. I regretted not paying more attention when Ellie tried to express her needs and her feelings of stagnation. I regretted not being more proactive in nurturing our relationship and keeping the romance alive amidst the routine of daily life. I wondered if I had become too complacent, too secure in the belief that love, once kindled, would remain unchanging even as we both grew and evolved. These reflections, however, were not just exercises in regret. There were also opportunities for learning, lessons about communication, about the need for continual nurturing of relationships, and about the importance of keeping connection and passion alive. They taught me about forgiveness too, both of others and of myself. It was this forgiveness that eventually brought a sense of peace, a reconciliation with the past that allowed me to move forward. As I shared these thoughts with Ellie during one of our family dinners, I saw a mirror of my own reflections in her eyes. She too had been thinking about our past, about what could have been done differently. I've had a lot of time to think, Ellie said, her voice soft but clear. And I've realized that while there are things I wish I could change, dwelling on them doesn't help. What matters now is that we're doing the best we can for Mia and Lucas. Her words resonated deeply. It was true, while we could not change the past, we had managed to forge something valuable from its ashes, a cooperative and respectful co-parenting relationship, and a friendship that, while different from our romantic bond, was based on mutual respect and shared history. This acknowledgement between us, this sharing of regrets and acceptance, seemed to strengthen the new phase of our relationship. It reminded us that while our marriage had not survived, our partnership in parenting and our respect for each other endured. This was our new foundation, built not on romantic love, but on a deep understanding and acceptance of each other as individuals. As night fell and the stars began to twinkle above, I felt a sense of closure. The regrets of the past would always be a part of me, but they no longer had the power to cloud my present or my future. Instead, they served as poignant reminders of life's impermanence and the importance of living fully and loving deeply, no matter the form that love took. As time passed, the sharp edges of our past softened into something more mellow, more reflective. Ellie and I found a rhythm in our co-parenting that felt almost natural, and our separate lives continued to evolve with new experiences and relationships. Mia and Lucas thrived, void by the stability and love both of their parents could provide, and by the new additions to their extended family who brought fresh perspectives and affection into their lives. Moving on wasn't about forgetting or dismissing the past. It was about building upon it, learning from it, and allowing it to shape us into better versions of ourselves. I learned to cherish the good memories Ellie and I shared, to respect our history for its role in shaping the present. This perspective helped me navigate the new chapters of my life with a sense of gratitude and openness. My relationship with my colleague, now a significant other, deepened over time. She was patient and understanding, never pressing me to leave behind what I needed to carry forward. Together, we explored new hobbies, traveled to places neither of us had been, and shared quiet evenings where the simplicity was a reminder of how peace felt. She was a different chapter, one that was unexpected but deeply appreciated. Ellie too seemed happier, more so. Her art not only became a career but a passion that painted her life with vibrant new colors. Her partner supported her dreams, standing beside her at gallery openings and celebrating her successes with genuine pride. Seeing her this way made me genuinely happy. It was clear that we both had needed to find our own paths to find ourselves again. One weekend, as we all gathered for Lucas's birthday, I looked around at the mix of family and friends and felt a profound sense of contentment. Ellie and I shared a smile across the room, a silent acknowledgement of the journey we had endured and the separate peace we had found. Our interactions were worn, the remnants of bitterness long since faded, replaced by a friendship that valued our shared past and respected our separate futures. As Mia and Lucas laughed and played, I realized that moving on was also about setting an example for them. It was about showing them that change is a part of life, that resilience is born from adversity, and that happiness is possible after pain. They needed to see that their parents could find new paths, new loves, and new joys, 
even as we held on to the bonds that kept us connected as a family. In moving on, I discovered a lot about myself, about my capacity for forgiveness, my resilience, and my ability to love and be loved in ways I hadn't anticipated. This new life was built not on the ruins of the old, but on its foundations, strengthened by lessons learned and shared experiences. As I watched my children play, a sense of peace settled over me. Life had moved on, and so had I. The path wasn't always clear or easy, but it was mine to travel, filled with potential and promise. With each step, I was more convinced that no matter what lay behind, the journey ahead was one I was ready to embrace with all its complexities and joys. 